Okay, technical session number 33, installing windows. Bear in mind, this does get into a little bit more depth than put in CD, click next and go. Uh, we're going to be getting into different types of installs, requirements needed to do the installs and uh, walking us through that process. So, throughout the course of this technical session, we will be able to name the differences between installing and upgrading an operating system. Describe the differences between an attended and unattended install. Name the key steps to install Windows, including the different ways to begin the process and identify common pitfalls that can occur when installing Windows and how to solve them. Compare and contrast the upgrade requirements of Windows 7, 8, 8.1, and 10, as well as getting into the upgrade path. Behavior, skills, and mindsets you want to keep in mind while going through this technical session or communication, as that is critical, because in IT, we work in teams. And there are often times when a problem will supersede the amount of time we are there, and we need to hand that problem off to another coworker, and we need to be able to quickly and succinctly tell them what's going on, let them know what steps we've taken to get there, and what the expectations are of the customer um, as to either getting an update or a resolution on this problem. Also, we need to maintain persistence when pursuing the solutions of problems because as IT professionals, our value largely comes from the amount of tools we have in our toolbox. So the more problems we are able to solve, the more valuable we become to the team as a whole. So even if you hand off a problem to tier two or tier three, I highly recommend you follow up with them to find out what, um, what they actually did to resolve that issue so that the next time that issue comes up, you will be able to resolve that issue in a pretty efficient manner. It allows you to add that extra tool to your toolbox. All right. When we do an installation versus an upgrade. Now, if you are upgrading, to a different version of Windows, if it allows for that upgrade path to happen. Um, say if you wanted to go from Windows 8.1 to 10, there may be an upgrade path available to you going from enterprise to enterprise. So you, you install it, it carries over all of your applications, your settings, your documents, all that fun stuff gets carried over with it. That would be an upgrade. Clean install means there is no operating system present or no upgrade path available to you. And you're going to quite literally do a fresh install of the operating system. Any previous settings or any documents or any of that stuff will be wiped out at that point for a clean install. It'd be as if you're installing an operating system to a new computer. You have repair installations. If you've had a bad malware attack, or um, damaged files or corrupted files or something along those lines that is causing your operating system not to repair or not to work properly, you may be able to do a repair installation where we'll go back and find these base files and go ahead and update them in the system so that they match the correct system files as they need to be. And in a sense, removing any corrupted files that were not supposed to be there in the first place multi or dual boot. If you're in a scenario where you want to run Linux sometimes, or you want to run Windows sometimes, or you want to create a Hackintosh, you can have Linux, Windows, and uh, Mike, and uh, excuse me, Linux, Windows, and Mac OS or OS X all on the same computer. If you have the available resources, you can do that. And that's where the multi or dual boot works in where you turn your computer on and it asks you which system you wish to boot into and you can go ahead and boot straight into one of those systems rather than having it predetermined when you turn on your systems also we're going to talk about remote installation um, 
pushing out new versions or installing to hundreds or thousands of computers at a time. If you're operating in an enterprise setting, you may not necessarily want to take the time to go through and install every single one yourself. That will take a very, very long time to do. So you can actually set up servers to push out the updates and or operating system installs to the computers themselves, which creates a lot less work for you on the back end. Questions so far? All right. So now we're going to talk about attended versus unattended. And the names pretty much tell you, for the most part, what, it, what they are. Attended means you're sitting there at the terminal yourself, walking through the installation process, answering all the questions as you're being prompted to do, and setting up the systems as you would like. Unattended means the system is configured, the operating systems and all applications needed with very little or no human intervention required. <clears throat> you could use uh, bootable media such as USB to go ahead and boot your operating system from. And then there is sysprep where you would create an image. Now, like we were talking about, if you're in an organization, you have different departments, like you have your accounting department, you would have your um, sales department, your operations department, your HR department. All of these groups would have different, not only permissions, but responsibilities and access levels. So what you may end up doing is creating an image of Windows that would have the user access availabilities on this, you know, for each type. So when you go ahead and create it, you just need to take the image, like if somebody new coming into accounting, you just take the image for accounting, you plug it in and you uh, load that image onto the computer that will give them all the permissions they need, all the file accesses they need, the settings they need, everything is put in place and you have tested this image so that you know it is a solid setup and it's a good place to get going. So in order to save time, many times they will have multiple images for the organization, depending on the departments and the levels of access that the people need. All right, RIS or remote install is basically what it says. It allows for several network installations at a single time uh, where you can push it out to tens, hundreds or thousands of computers, however many you need to and push the operating systems out to all of them. Rather than you going system to system and either plugging in USB or doing attendant installs where you're having to walk through and answer all the questions, that becomes a very inefficient use of time. So they utilize servers to push that out to all the other systems. All right. Before you do a install, you wanna do a final checklist to make sure that your system that you're going to be putting this this operating system on actually has all like the minimum hardware requirements to be able to handle the operating system you're about to put on it. Um, the next few slides are going to be going over the minimum install requirements uh, for different versions of Windows. Yes, you do need to know these off the top of your head um, because one, it's handy in the field. Two, they ask a lot of questions about it. So requirements, Windows 7. And notice that they are distinguishing between the 32-bit and the 64-bit. As you can see right here. So for the 32-bit, you need a one gigahertz processor. You need one gigabyte of RAM for the 32 bit. You need 16 gigs of free space, DVD ROM, DirectX 9 with WDDM 1.0 or higher. The rest, mouse, keyboard, internet extra access. Pretty standard. Now you get into the 64 bit, requires a gigabit processor, gigahertz processor, two gigs. Um, of memory, 
RAM and 20 gigabytes of free storage. Also DVD-ROM, DirectX 9, WDM. Are we good with this? Or do we need another second? Correct, correct, Janina. On newer computers, the DVD-ROM is kind of going by the wayside because the operating systems and stuff that are being installed many times are exceeding what the DVD-ROM can hold. And you won't see them as much on laptops because they're trying to make laptops smaller and smaller. Mm -hmm. And they just take up space. That's not true. They have uses. Eh. Without a DVD ROM, I wouldn't have been able to rip down all my movies. I would yeah, consider that a very valuable use. If that's something you're doing all the time, I'm sure. Well, when I get to digitizing my father's music, that's going to be a little insane. I think he has something like eight or 10,000 CDs I got to go through. <laughs> Kelly is a data hoarder, in case you guys I'm, not, I'm not, you know, well, I mean, a little bit. Well, uh, okay. a little, uh -huh. little bit. But my dad's a big audiophile. He, he is a fan of music, all genres. Can one be added as an optical drive? Yes, you can add it to, uh, <clears throat> to a tower as long as it has a space for it. Yep, a little port. And then, but for laptops, you can't really add it to the, the internal components. Like you can't. There, there usually isn't a space to add it, but you can get a USB optical drive, like converter. Yeah, an external one, like Mark said. All right, are we ready to move on? Basically anything from here down doesn't change. Focus on the top four. Or excuse me, I'll even go even higher. Here we go. <clears throat> top three sections are the main ones you want to focus on. Next, Windows 8 and 8.1. For the 32 bit, you need the one gigahertz processor. Um, with support for PAE, in X and SSE. PAE PA -E stands for physical access extension. In X is the NX processor bit and SSE is the streaming SIMD extensions too. They get into a little bit more detail with this stuff in the books with regards to what they do but understand that on Windows 8 and 8.1, it is a requirement on the processor. For the 32-bit, you also need one gigabyte of memory. For the 32-bit, you need 16 gigs of free hard drive space. This is both for 8 and 8.1. 
and then you need the DirectX 9 with WDDM1 or higher. Then you get into the 64-bit, which requires two gigabytes or one gigahertz processor, again, with the PAE, NX, and SSE. And then you get the two gigabyte for the 64-bit and then the 20 gigabytes of free storage. What are we noticing so far when I'm talking about this? that they require the same uh, processor in 32 or 64 bits. There, that's one thing. What else? Is there anybody noticing anything else? Are the same, almost the same requirements for Windows 7. With the exception of the processor. The type, about, yes. It's about that, identical. Yep. 32 bit, you have one gig, you have one gigahertz processor, one gigabyte memory, 16 gigs of free open space. Mm -hmm. Windows 8 and 8.1, one gigahertz processor, one gigabyte of RAM, 16 gigs free space. 8.1, one gigahertz processor, one gigabyte of RAM, 16 gigs free space. 32 bit architecture, your, your numbers are not going to change. You need to pay attention to the slight differences like the PAE, NX, and SSE on 8 and 8.1. But you should be able to rattle off for 32 bit architecture one gigahertz processor, one gigabyte RAM, 16 gigabyte memory. Main requirements 64 bit, one gigahertz processor, two gigabytes RAM, 20 gigabytes storage. So we have to remember the type of processor, PAE, NX, SSE? Yes, just remember that that was, if you get asked about that, that happens in 8 and 8.1. That's what makes those unique in their requirements. So when we go up to Windows 10, we don't need that anymore. We just need the one gigahertz processor. And then for the 32-bit, we have one gigabyte, RAM and 16 gigabyte storage. 64 bit, you have two gigabytes RAM, 20 gigs of storage. That does not change. That is in accordance with your 32 bit architecture of your chip or the 64 bit architecture of your chip. Now, you can put 32 bit operating system on a 64 bit chip. That is possible. Marvin did it for years. But you cannot put a 64-bit architecture on a 32-bit chip. That's your roadblock. So it, it flows in one direction. So just overall, remember those requirements for 32-bit and 64. You will see it again, and you will see it often. Are we good with those? All right. A little bit of a quick one. Oh. <laughs> You're welcome in advance. Hey, we'll only see good answers. That is my hope. Kelly, just a heads up, there is a pretty bad storm in my area. So if I kind of stutter out, that's why. Is it named Fred? I think so. Because we, we're getting uh, bands of Fred right now. Earlier when I was saying like, wow, it's picking up the rain. It was like, it sounded like static. When you look outside, it was like torrential downpour. Mm -hmm. It's pretty uh -huh. bad. Okay, well, noted. Well, we got lots of no answers. I know, nobody wants to answer the question. Got 10, 10 people in there, nobody answered. Oh. Got one. 9% participation, that's her. Jimmy needs a link. Let's see. There you go, Jimmy. Yeah. 
there's our code. Mm -hmm. So across the board, the 32-bit RAM requirements are the same. 32-bit storage requirements are the same. 32-bit processor requirements are the same with the slight difference with 8 and 8.1. And then you can do the same thing with your 64-bit architecture. Moving along here. All right, main methods you can use for installing and upgrading. We do have a few options here. You have the CD-ROM, which is woefully inadequate for modern operating systems, but hey, it's there. Um, you might be able to get away with it for, um, I don't even think you will for that because it's like 700 megs or your, or your max. So CD-ROM, I would go ahead and scratch that unless it has a DVD-ROM capability. DVDs would be the most common method for the most, you know, generally speaking, up until uh, the last five years or so. USB flash drives and solid state drives tends to be the most uh, common speaking now. Um, way to install operating systems and so forth. And then you have uh, Pixie servers or preboot execution environment, which is a way to push those operating systems from a server onto ongoing systems. Uh, Mr. King has a lot of experience with this with his previous job. Um, so he has done this quite a lot, if I remember correctly. Agree. I've heard of this mythical pixie, but uh, never actually seen one. But one of these days, I may. Pretty cool that if you have that pre installed on the network, all you got to do is legacy boot and search for that particular um, pixie and it takes off nothing else you're not pressing nets or anything it literally goes through the whole process of re reinstallation you'll do your after everything set up like do i want this do i want this i do click next and it takes off so you're saying it's an unattended install it is most definitely an unintended install. Got it. All right. Um, other methods that we can use is net boot. Um, developed by Apple, allows you to boot from remote locations, uh, uses your DHCP server uh, to receive the configuration do uh, data. And it works similar to the WDS Windows Deployment System or Service, excuse me. Now you have the external hot swappable device, similar to USB, uh, but a, an external hard drive um, can contain all the installation files necessary. Uh, the hot swappable we talked about earlier allows it to be disconnected without actually turning the system off. Uh, the external system can be set to boot first by configuring your BIOS settings. Uh, so it look as a, another drive. And then you also have your internal hard drive partition where you can actually set up multiple partitions within your drive um, and each partition be for a different operating system if you so choose, so long as you have the uh, storage and uh, resource allocation available for it. Looks like you wanna say something there, Avery. You're doing yeah. great. You sure? Yeah. All right. Didn't want to get too far astray here. All right. Uh, the boot method or the boot methods for installing and upgrading the key boot files you got to pay attention to your boot manager, BCD, uh, Winload, EXE, Noto S kernel. Might seem a little bit more familiar now that we know what the kernel is. And then you have winresume.exe. And then the key system files, the hal.dll. Just future reference, never alter DLL files. That can create all sorts of bad mojo in your computer if you do. 
Uh, so try to leave those alone. If one of those is altered and or damaged or corrupted, that is when you would have to give a recovery boot like we were talking about earlier. It also, it also is a vector of attack for a lot of hackers who are trying to corrupt your system. They try to go up to your DLL files. All right, SMSS, EXE, and then you have Win Logon, EXE, and LSAS, EXE. All right, now, when we do our installs, we have decisions to make. What size do we set the Windows partition? Although it will give recommendations. Uh, administrator account settings. Just a quick question. We set our, you know, if we're setting up new systems, do, you know, and, and then we have the main one that's the administrative account. Is that the one we, we should primarily use on our, on our computer? Getting a vigorous no out of Mark. Mark, you want to tell us why? Um, because it's just like, uh, you, if you mess something up there, you mess something up everywhere. You make a mistake there, it's pretty much transferred to the other users. Uh, you should you set go. up, um, a, another account, only use the admin account when you need to make changes. And that way, if you're not in there a lot, you won't mess anything up. Very good. And if you mess up in one of the other accounts, then you can use your, your administrator to fix that part. Beautiful. Thank you. Well put. Good answer. It's all, it also, the more you use the administrative account, the more vulnerable it is to outside attack, because if it's active and they get, and you click on that dangerous hyperlink as an administrator, they now have full access to your system rather than just access to a local account. So other things is for, with regards to security to take into account with regards to the administrator. All right, your network configurations. Where does it go to look for the internet? Where's the DHCP server? How does it talk to the, you know, the outside world? You know, this needs to be established. Whether to migrate. Uh, you have your USMT or uh, user state migration tools. Um, allows you to transfer user settings, applications, and, and files and such from your previous um, operating system over to the new one. And for smaller deployments, you could use a Windows Easy Transfer and it works a little more efficiently. Both are captured before the upgrade or installed and deployed after the process is completed. And they can also be used when upgrading computer systems as well. All right. Now, you need to know to a degree your Windows versions and additions. Do you need to spend hours memorizing this list? No. Yes. Really? It's a good idea to know these. Well, I, I will say that I, Avery I got has more taken, questions Avery than has I taken the test more recently than I have, so I will defer to him on that. <laughs> Let me be the tiebreaker. Let me be the tiebreaker. It doesn't hurt to know it. <laughs> I still kind of sat in the middle on that one. I, 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 tried to be, I tried to be nice to you guys. I got more questions on Windows versions than I wanted. OK. <laughs> so at least, yeah, be familiar with them. We'll go with that. And uh, we will get into upgrade paths because you can't necessarily go from Windows Starter to Windows 10, you know, Windows Starter 7 to Windows 10 Enterprise in one jump. It's not going to let you make those that big of a jump. And you can't go from Windows Enterprise 7 to Windows 10 Home. It's not going to let you make that jump either. So we got to know the upgrade paths. Kelly, you want me to take over? I guess since you, okay. since you, I mean, if you want, you're already, you're already telling me I don't know what I'm doing, so you know. We're, hey, we're if you want to take it, but just trying to, no, I'll hand it over. Trying to save you from embarrassing yourself any further. Oh, that's hurtful. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right, so some clean installation steps. Yes, Wait, Justin. Oh, yeah, there we go. 
Um, real quick again, what was the name of that file type you said, Kelly, that you don't want to download? So was it DLL? No, I said you don't want to modify it. You don't want to modify. Okay. You never want to modify your DLL unless you have a lot of experience with it. Because gotcha. you okay. can do a massive amount of damage messing around with the DLL files. Gotcha. We stop sharing here so Avery can grab it. It's up if you can see my screen. Got one, two, three, four. All right, awesome. All right, so our clean installation steps. There can be many issues and pitfalls when installing an operating system, some of which may require another attempt to install. So doing a thorough inspection of the system before starting the install might alleviate some of the issues. Uh, steps to perform a clean install or du dual boot will include if no operating system is installed on the PC, you can load the bootable media, which will either be a disk, external drive, or USB following the prompts. If the operating system is already installed on the PC, everything on the hard drive will be erased and replaced with a new clean version of Windows unless a dual boot choice is made. This will place two operating systems on the same computer, and the user will need to choose one operating system or the other, so BIOS will know which operating system to load. Installing a 64-bit operating system when a 32-bit operating system is already installed can only be accomplished first if the actual system architecture allows it. This must be a clean install and never an in-place upgrade. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Yes, sir. Y'all remember the pictures that I put up? It speaks exactly to that. My older PC, I had Windows 7 32-bit on it. But as you saw, I had the technology with the CPU, the processor, to handle 64-bit. It just didn't have that on there. And like Avery just mentioned, it required a clean install. It you cannot do an uh, in-place upgrade. You can't go 32 to 64. You have to start fresh with 64. No way you can make that jump without starting fresh. So clean install, not in-place upgrade. All yours, Avery. Yep. Thanks for the addition, Mark. Trying to stay on your good side. Hey, I appreciate it. All right, and it looks like we have a small quiz. So let's see some answers and then we'll go over the questions. You're live. Thank you. If I can move on from this. There we go. All right, to the installation. So this is what we're gonna do after our Windows installation. We're gonna load any of our third-party drivers. We're gonna uh, adjust our time, date, region, language settings to match your needs. Uh, you wanna make sure you install your drivers, your software, and Windows updates. So if you're just now installing Windows 10, you want to make sure that you have the most recent version of Windows 10. You want to properly format the boot drive. You want to verify that you have a network access. Make sure you activate Windows so that way you can change. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Marvin, help me out here. How do I word this as a question? 
Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. What, what happens when you activate Windows? Look at you. There we go. I just had to talk it out. This will require somebody to have had to get a brand new computer out of the box, brand new. But hold on. I know somebody that's just got a new computer. I'm going to call on her because she just recently went to Best Buy to get her. Uh -huh. <laughs> mm -hmm. So did you buy your computer already set up, uh, Kaylin, or did you get it out the box and you had to set it up yourself? Out the box, and I had to set it up myself. Okay, so once you got through the process of installing everything, naming it, what what else did it actually do? Oh, um, that's a very vague question. Let me get worse. <laughs> you needed to have access to the internet in order for Windows to to really identify that you are a legit user it was trying to i don't want see i got you avery it's hard to walk yeah. walk into that question like yeah. yeah uh i think we're just gonna have to tell them this okay. <laughs> all right oh, reason being is because most people may not have had to do that and i want them to know the the pros and cons behind it well there you go mark is my guy he's gonna mm -hmm. he's gonna Come in the click. So Mark know exactly what I'm talking about. He put authenticate software. So your Windows has a license to it. It's typically that little shiny sticker that's on the bottom of your computer, or it's on a desktop. It has a num a row of numbers. I forget how many. But we need to get you to go online to ensure that I'm not using Kalen's uh, Microsoft authenticated. Uh, code that's a one time use, it's just for Kalen. And the way that they do it now is through uh, internet connection. And that's why I was trying to get to Kalen if you had to go through a process of doing that. Let's say, for instance, you don't have um, a full version, you just have the ability to use it to install, which I did when I upgraded my, my computer. It's going to give you a little countdown 30 days, or you need to, you know. Uh, confirm that you have a, a legit code. If not, you know, your your privileges will be limited. So that's what I was trying to see, Caleb. Do you recall do you recall that? You may not have recalled it because it could have just been a part of uh your setup and it just could have just bypassed. You may not have paid attention. But do you recall having to uh, log in and authenticate your Microsoft Windows? I don't recall, but I do remember um, having to do the Wi-Fi to do the rest. Okay. Well, it's like I said, it's it's almost like it's not something that you'll look for if you're not looking for it. But in the process of setting up, Avery will, uh, will, was getting to that. That's one of the things. I need to confirm that you have a legit copy of Windows because people can't give you a copy of Windows and it not be legit. And it's tied to that that number. All yours, Amy. Thank you, thank you. All right, and so after we've activated our Windows, we're going to install updates and service packs, uh, configure automatic updates, so that way it stays up to date. Uh, we need to install any hardware, install applications, set up our user accounts, and transfer the user, user data, and you want to turn features on or off, depending on what you feel like you need. First thing I do when I get a new Windows computer, I turn off Cortana, download Firefox, and then I get rid of Microsoft Edge because I don't use them or need them. But some people like it. I'm not one of those people. Any questions? I have one. Uh, okay, no, Kaylin. Why did you? 
Why did you turn her off? Good, good, good segue. Because that is a, that was the question I was about to ask. Because I don't, I don't use her at all. I just don't use it. That's all. Guess what else she's doing to you? What? If anything that's running on your computer is taking away what from you? Storage space. Performance. Uh, bandwidth. It's a drain on your on your uh, your computer's utility. So it's just you don't need it if you don't need it going if you don't use it it's almost like the reason you'll turn off bluetooth because bluetooth is always listening even though you're not trying to get it to connect anything those things are always on if they're on they're always listening and miss sims brought up an excellent point when you're draining your resources you're gonna you're gonna drain your battery so you gotta find that's why airplane mode is so big in in, in certain instances because it turns out anything that would be draining uh some draining the resources from your uh, your device yep exactly so you want to disable anything you're not really using and if you have downloaded like applications or games in the past and you no longer play or use those applications getting rid of them frees up space that you can use for other of other things. All right, upgrade paths, Windows Upgrade Operating System Advisor. So the purpose, Microsoft created the Windows Upgrade Advisor to alleviate some of the issues that arise when trying to upgrade to other versions of Windows. It will advise on any known compatibility issues. It'll try to resolve some of those issues that it finds and it'll give you recommendations on what to do before the upgrade for planning purposes. So to access it, uh, it was first seen in Windows Vista, but can be downloaded for any operating system through the Microsoft website. So to tell you what you can download to, what it'll look like, and what you can't do. All right, Windows Anytime Upgrade. So this is another helpful tool in upgrading. So it's just another tool that we can use. It's already on your PC. Mm -hmm. And what it does is for people like Mark, Mark may have a computer that he had for a while and he's considering either upgrading it. So you use Windows Anytime Upgrade, it'll go through its checks and balances to see if it's able to successfully go from Windows 7 to Windows 10, and you still have a certain level of performance. If it's like, oh, no, you need to stay where you are. You don't have the resources, the pro the processing power. That's what this, this, this falls into. It gives you the option to know if, if you can really even handle that. Thank you, Marvin. All right, so upgrade requirements from Vista to Windows 7. This is a good image to have because it tells you exactly where you can upgrade to. So from Vista Home Basic, you can upgrade to 7 Home Basic, Home Premium, or Ultimate. So you can upgrade three different ways. If you have Vista Home Premium, you can only upgrade to Home Premium or Ultimate. If you have Vista Business, you can only upgrade to Professional, Enterprise, or Ultimate. If you have Vista Enterprise, you can only upgrade to 7 Enterprise, and Vista Ultimate only to 7 Ultimate. So a good image to have. And then our next image will include uh, requirements for Windows 7 to Windows 8.
I'm going to go ahead and move on to that. Feel free to come back to this slide in your studies. So when going from Windows 7 Starter, you can go to Windows 8 or Windows 8 Pro. Home Basic can go to Windows 8 or Windows 8 Pro. Home Premium, Windows 8, Windows 8 Pro. Professional, Windows 8 Pro, Windows 8 Enterprise, and then Enterprise to Windows 8 Enterprise, and then Windows Ultimate to Windows Pro. Should be a little easier to remember because there's less that it can upgrade to. Your three lower ones can only go to eight or eight pro. And then the three higher ones are gonna be pro or enterprise. Questions? All right, we'll move forward to 8.1. So Windows 7 can go to Windows 8.1. Windows 8 can go to 8.1, 8.1 Pro. 8 Pro can go to 8.1 Pro or 8.1 Enterprise. Pro with Media Center can go to 8.1 Pro or 8.1 Enterprise. Enterprise can go to Pro or Enterprise. Windows 8.1 can upgrade to 8.1 Pro, and then from Pro, you can go to Enterprise. In general, these upgrade paths are going to be pretty logical. Makes sense that you wouldn't be able to upgrade from your basic Windows 8 to your 8.1 Enterprise. And you're not going to be able to downgrade. So you're not going to be able to go from 8 Enterprise to just regular 8.1. Any questions before we move on? I know it's a lot, but taking the time to remember these will be very helpful. All right, upgrading requirements for Windows 10. So this is a little nicer of an image. So Windows 7 starter all the way to Windows 8.1 Pro, and it'll tell you whether or not it can upgrade to Home Pro or Education. So set then starter, Home Basic, Home Premium and Windows 8 and 8.1 Home Premium can only upgrade to Windows 10 Home. And then Windows 7 Pro, Ultimate, and Education. And 8.1 Pro can only upgrade to, or well, they can upgrade to Windows 10 Pro and then 8.1 Education and Pro can upgrade to Windows 10 Education. So most likely, if you went into an IT position now and they asked you to upgrade a system, you're probably going to be upgrading to Windows 10. So this will be a good image to have so you can know if you are able to upgrade. All right, troubleshooting installation problems. The installation process itself, and then I believe Marvin just posted that image in the chat, so feel free to download it. Uh, the installation process itself almost never fails. Usually something else fails during the process that is generally interpreted as an install failure. So different errors we can get. A media, media error, which could just be a scratch DVD. A RAID array not detected. That could be a driver issue. No boot device present. You could either have a bad disk or a CMOS is 
not set to look at the optical drive first. So going into your BIOS and changing your, your boot order can fix that. Hardware detection error. So you want to make sure that you check the compatibility beforehand. So it could just be that you didn't have the correct compatibility. And then lockouts. Unplug the PC and turn it back on. Boot into setup and rerun the installation. Windows will restart the installation automatically. Any questions there? All right. So an optional updated image for our minimum install requirements for Windows 7. This kind of is a easier image to look at from the ones we saw in the previous slides. So our hardware requirements for 32-bit versus 64, align processor requirement that your processor is the same. Memory for 32 is going to be 1, 64 is going to be 2 gigs. Hard drive space, 16 gigs, 20 gigs. So good image to have. And then an updated image for 8 and 8.1. The requirements are the same for both 8 and 8.1. So you just have to remember the differences between 32 and 64 bits. And you'll notice that everything stays the same, except for our process. It'll have our extra little letters beside it. So if you know the, if it says processor uh, that supports these things, you know it's going to be 8 and 8.1, because 7 and 10 don't have those. Marvin posted a ton of images in the chat, all super helpful for studying and just taking a little bit of time out of your day to look them over will get you that much closer to your A plus cert. All right, and then finally, our updated image for Windows 10. Same thing, it breaks it down to 32 and 64. And the, the differences are the exact same for 7, 8.1, 8, 8 and 10. So if you can just remember one gigahertz processor, one gig and 16 gigs for 32 bit, two gigs and 20 for 64, you'll be solid. And then it'll take us to lab directly associated with this technical session. And our objectives revisited. We should all be able to name the differences between installing and upgrading an operating system. Should be able to describe the differences between attended and unattended installations. We should be able to name the key steps to install Windows, including the different ways to begin the process should be able to identify common pitfalls that can occur when installing Windows and how to solve them. And we'll be able to compare and contrast the upgrade requirements of Windows 7, 8, 8.1, and 10. Any questions? We will be posting this into our Slack channel. So 